Good morning. And welcome on this beautiful Sunday, the last Sunday of April. Soon it will be May the 4th. <laughs> That's Star Wars Day. That's when my grandson was born. I really liked it that my grandkids have been born on days I can remember. My first grandchild was born on Christmas Eve. I can remember that. The second one came early and was born on Star Wars Day, May the 4th. So, so that's why I got it in my mind, because we're trying to figure out. He hasn't let us know what he wants for his birthday yet. So, The third one kind of made it a little easy. He was, he was supposed to be due sometime in the middle of July, and he was born on the 30th. So I can always remember the last day of April. I'm not July of April, so his birthday, he let us. He's too young to tell us what he wants, so we've gotten his present already. <laughs> well, welcome. A little side note there. If you could sign the attendance pads and pass them down, that would be great. Thank you for doing that. If you could draw a line between the 9 o'clock and the 11 o'clock and write 11, that helps the people who enter it in. Our prayer focus, I've made a slight shift on that. Um, our prayer focus is going to be for general conference. This is their last week. They'll be finishing up uh, this coming Friday. Uh, this first week is a lot of committee things. They haven't voted on a lot of things. They've been in committees trying to figure out what to bring to the annual conference. Uh, one of the things they did approve, which is a constitutional amendment, is they've uh, voted on between the U.S. churches and the worldwide churches to do what they call regionalization, which means allowing each region of the world to divide up and figure out what they want to do to reflect their own culture and things like that. But it's a constitutional amendment, so for it to, it can't just pass a general conference. It, it met the threshold for a constitutional amendment at general conference, but it now has to come back to all the annual conferences throughout the world and be passed by 75% of them, which is probably going to take a year and a half for that process to go. It's just like the Constitution amended. You've got to get things. But it'll probably go pretty rapidly, but that probably, uh, like Florida Bishop said, we probably wouldn't be able to vote on that until 2025 because there's just not enough time between the end of here and when we meet in June. So you can read a lot of the things that are going on. There's, if you just search a UMC General Conference 2024, they have a lot of news there. Um, May 19th, I mentioned this, is 5 p.m. We're going to do the baccalaureate service. And it's always neat that every year the senior parents plan all the senior activities. And one of the things they plan is a baccalaureate service. And every year I have gotten the same essentially phone call. The people who did it last year said, your church does a wonderful job hosting baccalaureate. Can you do it again? <laughs> and so that's an honor of what you do. And one of the things we provide for them is goodies after they eat. They're teenagers. They love to eat. And what we want are finger foods, which means you, something you can eat without a knife, fork, or spoon. You just put it on a napkin or a little plate and eat it because it's quick to clean up after that. So we'll need a lot of those and that'll be May 19th and we'll get the more word out as we get closer where you can drop those off. And also on May 19th during the service, we're going to honor anybody that's graduating that year. So if you have anybody in the family that's graduating, uh, we need that information by May 12th, which is Mother's Day. A VBS is going to be July 22nd through 25th, and we need a lot of volunteers to put that on. There's a sign-up sheet. We had it in there, but people, I guess, weren't getting there. But there's a sign-up sheet on the back table there. Uh, if you would like to volunteer, you can put your name there, because we need people not only to teach, but do a lot of setup of preparing food for the snacks for the kids. So please sign up back there, because we need a lot of people, and every year it's a wonderful time. Uh, tomorrow we have a track meet and we need volunteers to come and to help uh, control the people who park on our parking lot. Uh, we do ask for a donation and what we do is that money goes, uh, a part of that money is what funds our scholarship and we'll be giving away our third scholarship to a high school student on May 16th, I think is the uh, awards presentation. And so that's a wonderful thing. We give a $1,500 scholarship uh, to us a student at Satellite High, and uh, we're, it's weird, we kind of pick them, but we don't know who we picked, because <laughs> there's like five people on the, on the committee that pick it. We each get sent something and are told to rank them, and then our ranking goes in, and someone at the foundation that handles all the scholarships averages it, and then will tell us who we picked. <laughs> so, so we pick them, but we don't know who we picked. It's kind of weird. But it's worked out everywhere. We uh, we have an emphasis on we've always been looking for someone whose family it's the first time in their family going to college because we really want to help somebody 
to succeed and, and help them in doing that. Uh, I have a bunch of books in the back there. Every week I'm going to bring out more books because I can't move them with me. I can't leave them in the office because the new pastor expects a clean office when he comes in. So I've got all the books that I've collected over the years. Some of them are Marilyn's dad's books. Um, I've read most of them, uh, but I just some of them I haven't read since seminary. So they're back there, and they're going to be kind of in sections of thought. What I got back there today is a lot of method. What does it mean to be a Methodist? Methodist history and church history, that kind of stuff. So you're invited to go back there and see if there's a book that would interest you. And next week I'll have more books. And the other thing that we need to kind of get more formalized is, as you notice, we're taking up the offering again. And so we need people who were willing to be able to take up the offering. And, and it's been kind of frantic because every Sunday I come in and try and find somebody. Can you do it? Can you do it? So I have a sign-up sheet back there. If that's something you would feel comfortable doing, passing the plate and then bringing it up here for the, at the end of the doxology and just putting it back there at the end, please sign that up. And we do have someone who will then kind of call you and see what Sundays you can work. Because when the new pastor comes, he's not going to know who to ask. And so we need to kind of formalize that. And one of the things in passing the plate that we've, we've, we've seen, because we're doing it the first service and the second service, is our, just our loose plate offering has tripled since we left, when we had it in the back to passing of the plate. Because when we pass the plate, we're giving people an opportunity to give. When we leave it back there, they forget. They go, oh, I'll do it after the end of the service. But you forget. I forget a lot of things by the end of the service. <laughs> So um, if, you can, if you can help pass the plate, please sign up and just leave either an email or your phone number. So thank you for that. And so with this then, let us prepare our hearts and minds for the worship of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
Amen. At this time, let us stand for a call to worship. All dominion belongs to the Lord. Let us praise the Lord in great con- in the great congregation. And please remain standing for our gathering hymn this morning, number 674, See the Morning Sun Ascending. <laughs> Son ascending, radiant in the eastern sky, hear the angels' voices lending in their praise to God on high. Alleluia, alleluia, glory be to God on high. Please join together in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Yeah. 
you may be seated. We now come to that time where we lift up our prayer requests and our praises. Any praises this morning? Anything good happening out there? Yes. So a praise for Ali. A nana, not a grandma. Grandma sounds old to some people. Oh, we're glad. Other praises. Yes. Hayden has picked Cleopatra as her topic for the last meeting Friday, and she's very excited about it. That's an exciting topic. God answers prayers, and I'm so glad he does. Other praises, yes. That's all that. Okay, what time is that? 4.15. Yes. Well, we will keep you in our prayers of the procedure and pray that God gives you the right words and voice to speak to the people you encounter. Other praises or prayer requests? Yes. So your 87-year-old brother's in the hospital with a blood clot. We will keep him in our prayers. Uh, keep Willis in your prayers. He does the, he's the worship leader at our first service. Um, his father passed away about a year, a year, week ago, and so he was gone to the service, this uh, celebration, this uh, last weekend. But his mother had passed away just a couple months earlier, so he's lost both his mom and his dad here in a span of about three months. So keep him in that whole family. I think there's eight kids, so keep them in your prayers. Yes? Our daughter is in her senior year at UCF, and she was just notified that she has a 4.0 GPA and is on the Dean's Honor Roll. So that's a praise. The back. Yes, the back. Yes. Okay, so we're praying for your son. He's on a long trip in Spain. <laughs> and, yes, what? So four neighbors in hospice. In your condo. We'll keep them in our prayers. Yes. I just want to say our 
Donna's aunt and uncle have been visiting with us for the last week and a half. They've come to church twice. They came back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always and, amazed when people come back. <laughs> they're, they're leaving on Tuesday for a trip back to St. Louis and tra some traveling mercies for them and a chance to rest from their vacation. <laughs> well, we will be praying for that. Yes. You're glad they're, they came back. Yes, Shauna. So an 11-year-old boy named Leo needs prayers. He was diagnosed with what? Leukemia. And Haley, what did you get honored with? So she was named the, at FIT, the student of the year, and got to Phi Kappa Phi, Phi yeah. The thing I didn't get into. <laughs> well, congratulations. Well, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, God of grace and peace, we thank you for blessings. We thank you for love. We thank you for answer to prayers. Because, Lord, you have said when we are connected to you to ask for anything and we will receive. That when we are in your spirit seeking you first, putting you first in our lives, you will be with us and give us power. And so, Lord, we thank you that you are that God, that you answer prayers, that you interfere in our lives for the good of us. And we come this morning to thank you, to praise your name. And Lord, as we come here this morning, we do lift up all those people in Nebraska and elsewhere that were dealing with the terrible tornadoes these last few days. Lord, some small towns have had major swaths just destroyed. People have been displaced from their homes and businesses, and we just lift them up to you, Lord. And we, we ask that you surround them with support, with love and help so that they can put their lives back together, Lord. In this great hour of need, Lord, bring blessing to them. Bring help to them. Bring what is needed. And Lord, we also lift up all those prayer requests that we have named before you just a few moments ago. Because we know you are the source of life. You are the source of hope. And you protect. And you restore. And we even now, Lord, lift up to you all of those on our prayer list. You know their needs, Lord. We just know they need you. And we thank you that you hear our prayer. And we even now, Lord, lift up to you that one name, that one request that is silent in our heart that we name before you now. And gracious Heavenly Father, we want to continue to be your church. We want to walk in your ways. And we thank you, Lord, that when we as a church are connected to you, we bear much fruit that people see the fruit we bear and can see that you are glorified in it and communities are changed by it. So Lord, continue to bless this church. Open our eyes to the power you have given it, the purpose you have given it so that we can walk in that power and purpose. Continue to show each one here individually what you have called them to do, how you have called them to reach out in love to their neighbor, to those they meet. So Lord, bless all of those seeking to walk with you. And we thank you for Jesus Christ who makes it all possible, who came to earth to show us the love of the Father, who came to earth to die our death. And Lord, we are so grateful that he didn't stop there at dying for us, but that he rose again to offer us eternal life into that eternal place of glory. And we now close the prayer in the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
And at this time, we invite our children to head off to Children's Church. They'll go through the double doors over there in the room on the right, and we will continue to worship here.
Amen. We come now to that time where we lift up our tithes and offerings. And one of the things, I look at numbers a lot. I look at our giving. I look at our attendance. And in looking at our attendance, I always have to wait till April to figure out where are we compared to last year, especially years like this, because this year Easter fell in March. Last year Easter fell in April. So you can't really compare March's numbers to March and April to April because Easter kind of skews things a little bit. But in looking at where we are, this is the last week of April, and I kind of guessed that about this many people would be here and put that number in. And this year, compared to last year, we're worshiping about 12 more people a Sunday, that people are seeing what's going on. And a lot of that is a product of what we do in the community. It's people are not looking, remembering what we are doing right this minute. This is not what we are known for. <laughs> We are known for what we'd go out in the community and do. And it's because of your giving that we are able to go out and to bless the community in many different ways. And I'm just grateful that during the whole COVID thing, that during this whole upheaval with the church, that we have never stopped doing what we've been doing in the community. We haven't slowed that down one bit. We've made some drastic changes in the operating of the church, but we haven't stopped meeting the needs of community. And that's because of your faithfulness to give. So thank you for that. And at this time, if the ushers could come forward. And they'll demonstrate how easy it can be so that one of you can volunteer too to be this. <laughs> Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for so many blessings. We thank you for your love, your grace, your peace. And Lord, now as we come and return a portion of all that you bless us with. And so Lord, as we present these are ties to you through this church, guide this church in their use, multiply them for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
my heart burdened be Then I am still and wait here in the silence Until you come and sit a while with me prayer request I forgot to mention is Amanda is without voice (laughs) and she probably would like her voice back sooner than later because when you lose your voice you realize how frustrating life is especially with two little ones (laughs) the two little ones might not want her to get her voice back but (laughs) so we are praying for you our scripture this morning comes from the gospel of John the 15th chapter beginning the first verse Hear now these words. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. 
Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks. I came across this story. David Troxell was sharing about his son when he was eight years old. He came home from school bringing home a stuffed animal. And naturally, he asked his son, how did you get this animal? And he said, I won it at the Valentine party we had in class. And so he asked him, well, what did you have to do to win it? And his son said that his teacher put all the names of everyone in class in a bowl and drew out my name. But as he said this, he kind of hung his head low and said, but I cheated. And he had a, dad had a puzzled look. What do you mean you cheated? He said, I prayed. (laughs) Well, I don't know if praying's cheating. I don't count it in that category of cheating. And I don't know if God answered this eight-year-old's prayer to win a stuffed animal or not. Because if everybody in the class prayed for it, how do you answer that prayer? But this eight-year-old did have an attitude that there was power in prayer. He knew that. And in our gospel lesson this morning, Jesus tells his disciples, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. And Jesus, when he tells his disciples this, this is the last time he's going to meet with them. The next day he'll be crucified. And we know, though, that Jesus taught that there's power in what we are able to do through faith. And we read this in Matthew, in his teaching there, in the 17th chapter of Matthew. This is where a father brings his son to Jesus and said, look at the terrible condition of my son. I brought him to your disciples, and they couldn't do anything for him. So Jesus ends up healing him. Then Jesus makes a kind of harsh statement to the disciples and those around him. He turns and he says, Oh, unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? This isn't what you want Jesus to say to you. (laughs) This isn't, you know, on the good side, and it probably wasn't one of the better days for the disciples. And we know they're frustrated and confused by it because we read in Scripture that they come to him after everybody's gone, and they say, Come on, Jesus, tell us what went wrong. And Jesus tells them then, because you have so little faith, I tell you the truth, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Now when Jesus is with his disciples on that last night, he is again teaching them about the power that comes through faith. Only this time he doesn't use the word faith. Because when we talk about faith, sometimes we go, oh, that's a churchy word. I don't even know what it means. I don't know how to put it into practice. But this night, Jesus doesn't use the word faith. He begins to use an image. He uses an image that demonstrates a relationship. And I believe that this is an important concept because it gets to the heart of why Jesus came. See, Jesus came to restore our relationship with God, to reconnect us with God to reconnect that relationship that had been broken at the very beginning in the fall. And this passage helps us understand the relationship between grace and faith. Grace creates the faith relationship. And grace is not something we do. We cannot own grace. It is given to us. It's not from something we do. God freely gives us. But it is what God, grace is what God does through Christ's action that enables us to have faith a faith that can move mountains. And faith is a life in covenant with God and with neighbor. See, because faith is relational. And we see that in this illustration of the vine and the branches and the, and the saying by Christ that if we remain in him and his words in us, then nothing will be withheld from us. In essence, it is staying connected with Christ. 
being in relationship with him that gives us power to live, to succeed, to glorify God. The connection is so important in how we live our lives because it means everything to our faith, I believe. Donald Strobe, he shared this story of a sermon sometime a while back, and he said years ago, it was in Belfast, Ireland, located in Northern Ireland, the members of a large Presbyterian decided to survey the 2,000 homes around their church. And they want to get the feelings of people and faith and relationships that way. And when they came in, the pastor's going through that. And, he, and as he's going through, he kind of began to focus at the very bottom of the surveys where people could write a comment. And there was a similar theme to the comments over and over again. A lot were like, used to be Presbyterian, but don't longer attend anymore. Or the children go to Sunday school at the church, but the parents aren't interested. But then his eyes fell on a very unusual comment at the bottom of one of the surveys, which simply read, Presbyterian, but disconnected. As I read that, I'm thinking, that's all too many people in our country today. They may call themselves Christians. They may say, I have a faith. They may say, I believe in something, but they're disconnected from that faith, from that belief. Years ago, polls kind of said that in any given Sunday, only 40% of a church attendance would be in church on that Sunday. That's not a very big number. That's been kind of proven out everywhere I've been. It's even here that only 40% of the people who said, I will support this church come on any given Sunday. And then the person who put the poll together said they actually believe it's only about 20% because people lie to them. <laughs> That's amazing that people would lie to somebody who's, who's taking a survey because they don't want to look bad. They don't want to tell a pollster, I don't attend church when they say they're a Christian, so they lie. But let's look at how Jesus describes this connection. In verse 1, he tells us the relationship between father and son. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. The father is the one who trims and prunes the healthy branches and helps them to grow. Then in verse 5, he says that he is the vine and we are the branches. Christ is one again telling us that he is the source of life and that he is the living water, the living bread, the word of life, the prince of life, our foundation, our rock, our redeemer, the resurrection and the life. He is all things to us. And it is being connected to Christ that gives us life. Listen to what Christ says again. Only well, the translation I'm using here instead of abide says remain. Where Christ says, remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, whatever you wish will be given you. Now when you hear that again, there's something that pops up, a word over and over again. Christ mentions the word remain, or as we read at the beginning, abide eight different times in that short little passage. He's trying to get across the that we need to remain, abide in Him, His presence, His love, His power. And I've lived a while as a structural engineer. And what I found over the years, because I did a lot of investigation of failures and things that go wrong, um, connections had a lot to do with when buildings fail. If you don't have the right connection, sometimes they're fail. And I was living in Naples, Florida, when Andrew came across... Uh, homestead in Miami there, Key West, and went up through the south of Naples. A lot of houses there lost their roof. And the engineers after that wanted to know why some houses kept their roof on and others lost their roof. And what they finally realized is that the houses that lost their roofs were not connected, the roofs were not connected to the structure. They might have looked like they were connected, but they weren't connected. Basically, the truss was sitting there, and someone just kind of nailed the nail in at an angle on one side and the other side, or put a plate up there, but didn't put the right number of nails to it. And one of the things that happens in a hurricane, why you should never open your garage door during a hurricane or open a door, is when a hurricane comes through and a door opens, a window is broken and opens, pressure builds up on the inside of the house, and that pressure wants to go up. And if your roof is not connected to the house, the roof will go up too. And that's the way we are. 
we might look connected to God. We might say, oh, I come to church every day. I pray maybe every now and then. I, I, I have all the looks of being a Christian, but we're really not connected to Christ and all he's asking. And when trouble comes our way, we fail, we lose our top. We crumble under it because we're not connected to the source of the power. We need to be connected. So the question might come up, how do we know whether we are connected or not? How do we know whether we got just a couple nails nailed at an angle or we got a solid plate in there with the right number of nails in it? And Jesus answers this as emphatically as he says we need to be connected. He puts it in terms of a healthy vine branch. A healthy vine branch, one connected to the vine, is producing fruit. Christ mentions bearing fruit five times in this passage. We know we're connected to Christ when we bear fruit. And so what does bearing fruit look like as a Christian? Well, if we turn to the 25th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, we find Jesus telling us what fruit looks like. Again, we're in the last days of Jesus' life on earth. He has been talking about the end times and what heaven likes. And and he tells the people that when he comes in all his glory, he will gather the people from all the nations and will separate them like a sheep separates the sheep from the goat. The shepherd separates the sheep from the goat. Listen to what he says in Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in the heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd shepherd separates the sheep from the goat. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes, then you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. And I was in prison and you came to visit me. Jesus in that one moment gives us a wonderful glimpse of what it means to be a disciple. It doesn't mean we can understand all the theological arguments out there or can answer every question someone may have. It's, did we show compassion to our neighbor? Did we do it to the least of these as though we were doing it to Christ? That's what it means to bear fruit, by loving them actively, not passively. See, bearing fruit is going out and intersecting people in their lives where their need is, not ignoring them and passing by. And the church has always thrived where fruit was being produced, and it always declined where fruit wasn't. Let me give you a couple examples of what I mean, how the church grew, how died and grew by bearing fruit this way. Eric Swanson wrote an article entitled, Is Your Church a Good Neighbor? And in the article, he notes that when the communists came to power in Russia in 1917, They attacked Christianity in a very unique way, one that hadn't been done very often. What they did was they came in and said, oh, we believe in freedom of religion. The churches can exist. And they allowed the churches to exist. They allowed them to be in the corner. They allowed them to gather on Sunday morning to meet, to pray, to sing hymns. But they said, you cannot go outside your church walls and evangelize. You cannot go outside your church and do good works. There was no fruit that could be produced. No longer feed the hungry, educate the children, take in orphans, or care for the sick. And so for the next 75 years, the church existed and declined because it became irrelevant to the communities because it couldn't bear fruit in the communities. It couldn't go out and be compassionate in the communities. It couldn't go and help. And it declined to where it almost died. Swanson talked about another country, the second example that was taken over by communists, which was China. China took the approach of the Romans. We're going to wipe it off the face of the earth. They chose to persecute the church, to basically obliterate it. It's interesting that when the communists came, took over in China, there were only several hundred thousand Christians in China. And the communist Chinese closed the churches. The Red Guard was sent out on a rampage. Wherever they found the cross, they destroyed it. They put Christians in prison. And they were driven to the countryside. And if you go into China now, with all that we hear about it, you won't find several hundred thousand, but you will find millions of Christians. And they grew through that persecution because they reached out. They continued to reach out to those that were hurting. 
Paul Kaufman, who lived in China with his family and observed what's taking place today with the Christians, he wrote a book called China, The Emerging Challenge. And in that book, he gives us a clue as to why during the days of persecution, millions of people would come to know Christ. In one example, he talked about a group called the Jesus Family in northern China. And in 1942, a severe famine hit that area of northern China. And aid came pouring in from other countries, other churches around the world to help feed the starving people. But the Jesus Family in northern China refused the aid. They went on to help the people feed. They were an agricultural community. And they began to give away what they grew. First they gave away 10%, then they gave away 20%. And then they got up to where they were giving 20, I mean 90% of everything they grew and produced, they were giving away to feed the hungry. And when people came up to them, asked them, why would you refuse aid when others were starving? This is how they responded. They said, those foreign churches would have robbed us of our anchor. It's our financial needs to go and to help people that drive us to our needs and force us to cry out to him. They, along with other Christians in China, knew that their anchor was Jesus Christ, being connected to him and bearing fruit. And they weren't going to let other people bear that fruit for them. See, God has given each church a task to go and to bear fruit. As I said a little bit ago at the offering, people do not know this church for what's going on this right now. People don't talk about our worship service. They should. But that's not what people see. What people see is us when we go out in the community the other rest of this week, where we go out and help them, where we feed them, we help educate them, We give where is needed. We bear fruit and the people see the fruit and God is glorified. That is how we demonstrate our discipleship. Look at how Jesus closed this talk about the vine. He said, this is is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. That's how we're known. That's how people will judge us. Are we bearing fruit? The way we can continue to do that is to put Christ first. And if we put Christ first in our lives, everything else will fall into place. It sounds crazy that I put Christ ahead of my wife, put Christ ahead of my family, put Christ ahead of my job. But when I do that, all those things fall into place. Because Christ doesn't want me to abandon my children, hate my wife, and be a pest at work. (laughs) He wants me to succeed at all those things. It begins with Christ and being connected to him. And we're connected to him when we bear fruit by connecting ourselves to those in our neighbors, our neighborhoods, our neighbors. And when we do this, our own lives will be so filled with so much more that it will sustain us when those troubles come because we'll be part of a connection that cannot be broken. Bear much fruit by staying connected to Christ. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you are our source of all we do. You are our strength, our power. And Lord, help us to see that if we only hear the word but never do the word, we are a dead church. That we must both hear the word and dwell on it and do the word to be whole, to be an alive church, to be connected to you, to bear good fruit. So Lord, help us to bear fruit, fill us with the Holy Spirit, empower us through the Holy Spirit to go and to be your witnesses, your instruments of faith, your instruments of good, to be your arms and legs, your hands and feet in these communities. Help us to have compassion as you have called us to, to love as you have loved. And then we will bear fruit. We thank you for this power. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please stand and join together in our closing hymn, They'll Know We Are Christians by Our Love.
just a quick reminder, if you'd like to go grab any book I got back there, they're free to take. And also, if you'd like to sign up for VBS or if you can help usher, please sign up back there. Now, as we prepare to leave, let us reach up and grab God's hand. Because know that when we grab his hand, he is going to stay connected to us. He's going to walk with us wherever we go. He will guide us and lead us and love us. So go hand in hand with God and share Christ's love to the world. Amen.